sure. Excuse me one moment. Monks already won by 3,000 more votes than there are voters. Only three, make it 20, 30. We don't need a victory, we need a Roman triumph. But we don't have any more ballots. Remember the first rule of politics. The ballots don't make the results. The counters make the results. The counters keep counting. Yeah, keep counting. <laughs> you know, it's, kind of, it's great. That was Boss Tweed uh, from Gangs in New York, um, which is the name of the show. We're going to get into a little bit more than that. But, you know, I was talking to Eric last week about the idea, and I realized that there is a lot of uh, uh, synergy between what happened then and what's happening now. Uh, there are massive immigrant gangs running, just where I got the idea from, there's massive immigrant gangs running loose in New York who have quickly formed into gangs. They didn't show up as gangs. Uh, they are doing certain things that the Democratic Party is not happy with or happy with, which we're going to get into. Uh, there's also the the dialogue in our culture of a second civil war, which people have been discussing for the past two years of how this would happen. And I thought about that after last week's show. And I, I said to Eric, you know, there's the synergy of a civil war. There's gangs. And all of a sudden I reminded myself of Gangs of New York, uh, not just the movie, but the actual factual events. Uh, when I was growing up, we learned some of it in school, but not all of it. Obviously, uh, this is referring to the Martin Scorsese movie of 2000, but there's far more to it than just the movie. And it has a lot of resonance to what's going on in New York today. Uh, again, like I said, people are discussing civil war. They have these migrant gangs. They've got violence. They've got shootouts. They've got all this stuff. And it kind of like what happened in the 1840s and 50s in New York, Eric. Yeah, I agree. And uh, the same guy, Boss Tweed, we just saw. Yeah. We're yeah, very yeah. happy to welcome everybody in who's going to be a voter. Come on right. in. Come on in. You're going to be a voter. You're well, be a voter. again, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, um, that dead rabbit hole, he <laughs> met them at the docks. Boss Tweed met them at the docks and gave them hot soup and bread, not unlike meeting them at the border, giving them a cell phone and a debit card. Uh, mm -hmm. Or when they get to New York, the similarities are breathtaking. Again, it's the same Democratic Party. In, in this case, it was the Irish uh, coming to New York because of the uh, massive famines in Ireland. They came in droves. And I mean, hundreds of thousands of Irish people came with another religion, Catholicism, like they're coming today. I don't know how relevant think, that is to today. It's about 1.2 million, and there was only 8 million people in Ireland. So it's right. like it drained like you know 15% of the entire Irish population into here. Well, a million died from the famine. So that eliminated a million right there. Okay, but so. if, 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 so yeah, no, no, that was a million right off the top. There you go. But if somebody drew a straight line from Ireland, it went directly to New York. A, an inch up was Boston, and a lot of them went to Boston. But a straight line across the Atlantic ended up in New York City. And that's really why they came to New York City. And they came uh, without skills. They came without money. And they ended up in the five points, which we're going to get into. But there's also another, there's the Civil War angle to this, like I said about Civil War 2.0, which a lot of people have been discussing in this country uh, for the past couple of years. There is an immigration problem in this country like there was in New York in the 1840s and 50s. And there's also a thing about the Democratic Party in New York wanting them to come in and vote Democratic like you're you're showing right there with Jim Broadbent uh, playing Boss Tweed. Now, keep in mind, Boss Tweed is not the mayor. People thought he was the mayor. He was the head of the Democratic Party uh, running out of Tammany Hall. And Tammany Hall was a physical place. Mm -hmm. In New York, it was on Lower Broadway. I think it was 231 Broadway or something like that. Uh, 231 Broadway, yeah. It was a physical building, which was the headquarters of the Democratic Party. Uh, the other side of the equation is 
the nativists or the Whigs or the Know Nothing Party, which would later all be combined into the Republican Party. Uh, the nativists uh, were the ones who fought in the Revolutionary War. They are tracing their ancestry back to England. They're Protestant. Uh, they're people who, uh, I'll tell you something interesting. The Tammany Hall controlled the licensing like they do now, just mm -hmm. like they do now. And butchers had to get a license, as did a bunch of other jobs. So ta one of the main, one of the many corrupt things that Boss Tweed did was he dispersed licenses to his Irish brethren uh, for their vote. And this really pissed off people in, uh, in lower New York and in New York who had been here since the revolution, Eric. And they were now seeing for the first time the changing of their religion and ethnic makeup of the United States, and especially in this case, New York City. Yeah. And I mean, we're America's untold stories, but we're seeing a, a perfect example of it with London. I was shocked when they went over the demographics in London, what it was like 20 years ago, what it is now, where, um, what was it, white, Protestant, whatever, it was the majority, like 80% and is down to like 35%. Or yeah. Well, they were worried about the Pope uh, running these Irish in New York. And that, that was not an exaggeration because the Popes had a direct line to uh, the people running the church in New York and were telling them how to vote. So, I mean, it may not have come through the bat signal of the Pope, but it was coming from the pulpit. And the, Right, yeah. And the church, they were literally going crazy because they were controlling the votes of the Irish uh, on who to vote for. So the nativists, the Know Nothing Party, which I think with the previous president, I forget his name, um, before Lincoln, and there was a phrase uh, that went... I know nothing but my country. My country is all I know. Mm. That was the quote that the president ran on. I forget who it was uh, who ran on that. It must have been Fillmore. a waiter. Fillmore ran on it. And that's where the Know Nothing Party came from. And when you look at what was going on downtown, even Charles Dickens, you mentioned London. Charles Dickens showed up from London, went to the five points and said, this is the worst slum in the world. It makes London look like high society. And this is the guy who wrote A Christmas Carol and other things about slums in London. Uh, Mark Twain, uh, uh, Lincoln showed up. He couldn't believe it. Everyone who showed up to the five points. Now, keep in mind, the five points are five streets that no longer exist. Maybe a little bit of Mulberry exists. This is right below Canal Street. Uh, it's been completely reconfigured. Where now it is essentially Federal Plaza, the Federal Court building. It's all been taken over by the Fed and state courts and stuff like that, uh, because they couldn't really do Correct anything. politics, take it over? No. <laughs> yeah, well, they had, eventually they leveled everything. It was so insane. You know, until Jacob Rees, uh, who was a photographer, came there in the late 70s and 80s and took photos of it, uh, nobody knew what was going on down there, because think about it. I mean, Matthew Brady is photographing. Th these are Reese's photos. There's 30,000 children who are homeless living on the streets of New York, just children, uh, not regular people. I'm talking about children uh, who slept on the streets of New York. Nobody knew this because nobody saw this until Jacob Reese, who later on, we would go to Jacob Reese Park as kids uh, out in the island, not knowing who Jacob Reese was. But just look at these photos. These were all from Jacob Reese. Amazingly, how they crammed into each other, these little children, like four years old, five years old, six years old, uh, living on the streets of New York. Uh, just absolutely appalling. And yet there was no social welfare programs. There was nothing. And they were overwhelmed like today. Like now, they had nowhere to put the Irish. They, this is just this is a guy who I thought was the cover of an album when I first saw this years ago. This is a guy who actually lived in that shack in back of a building because they were tenement buildings. They were apartment buildings. And then they were just like these wooden makeshift shacks that people would 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 cobble together and live in like a shanty uh, almost like yeah in the middle of manhattan i mean it really is crazy but it, it goes back to starting with with no water this is really interesting because I, I cover this in my book rehab nation and we talked about it when the pilgrims came over on the mayflower how they didn't have drinking water there was cholera in new york in 19 in 1836 killed thousands and thousands of people 1832 they did not have drinking water in New York. Now, there was a, a company called the Manhattan Company that originally made wooden uh, aqueducts 
to run uh, clean water into lower Manhattan. That Manhattan company was run by a guy named Aaron Burr. And they would get Aaron Burr uh, gave up on the water part of the Manhattan company. The other part of the Manhattan company was banking. And that became Chase Manhattan. That's where Chase Manhattan comes from, from the Manhattan Water Company, because there was no money in water and they couldn't keep clean water. Water had to be brought over. This is unbelievable by horse and carriage from Brooklyn. So you can mm. imagine how limiting that is. There was a pond right downtown. It was called the Collect Pond, right in the middle of the Five Points, completely filled with sewage and feces uh, within 20 years. Uh, just like in London, just like I keep telling people, the reason they drank alcohol was because water gave you cholera. And I know people are going to push back on this and thinking, how could they not drink water? You're just going to have to take it to the bank. They drank alcohol and they drank uh, distilled alcohol and they drank beer and wine. Yes, there was no milk. There was no homogenization. There were no fruit juices. There was no soda. I know this is incomprehensible. No coffee. They there weren't was doing nothing. It there. there was nothing. They started to boil water for tea, but that is until the mid-late 1800s, folks, until tea shops opened up in London and coffee started to come in through the uh, uh, slave coffee sugar triangle from the Bahamas. But that's going to be And it didn't little... hit the poor people at first either. Right, that absolutely. the high right. end and then finally came down. So. Right. I mean, there, there were places, I, I'll put it this way. These I'm going to get into some of these bars and some of the nightclubs that are down there. There was bars that you would like to go to with your family called the Billy Goat, the Hell Hole, the Harp House, the Inferno, Mother Woods, McGurk Suicide Hall, the Rosedale uh, uh, Chokers. Uh, I mean, these were nightclubs <laughs> that were really saloons where you could get a punch. Yeah, this, this is like a painting that uh, Scorsese used a lot to design his uh, Five Point set, which was built in Italy. Um, outside of Rome, uh, when, in a famous studio that they used in Rome that Mussolini actually built. Uh, but yeah, you could see the overcrowding. You could see what's going on there. And a note that I saw, thought was interesting is grocery, 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 grocery. Apparently, go grocery was a code word for a bar. Yes, yes, they called it groceries, yes. In that bar, you could get a punch made out of whiskey, hot rum, benzene, and cocaine for six <laughs> cents. But my favorite things, and I learned this years ago, my favorite things were the pillow rooms and the velvet rooms. The pillow room, this is unbelievable. The pillow room, you go into the back of the bar and you put your head on a pillow with your face up and they put a hose into your mouth and they turn the spigot on and you got a drink like that as much as you can swallow without it coming out of the sides for three cents. Okay, that was one way to get, get drunk. The other way was the velvet room uh, where the whole room was velvet. This was more upscale, and they gave you a giant bowl of alcohol, and you just went in there and drank yourself into a stupor, and they put you to sleep in the velvet room. Uh, dude, they had so they had. Is a that what Hellcat Annie was doing? Well, that's Hellcat, Hellcat Maggie. Man, Maggie, Hellcat Maggie. Yeah, she <laughs> she was one of the bouncers. I think she was over six feet tall. She was one of the bouncers, and one of her things that she would do. I think she was in the Gurks. She would bite you on the ear and drag you out while having her teeth, those sharpened, whittled teeth, uh, on your ear, right? Okay. So if you resisted, she would bite off your ear and put it in a pickle jar, which was on top of the bar where there were about 50 of them that she had bitten off. In other words, there was ear, 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 all in, in pickle jars, clear pickle jars on top of the bar. Uh, but... My favorite place was Kit Burns' Rat Pit. Now, Kit Burns' Rat Pit, uh, which was also down in an Astor Place down there. Kit Burns, or, or on the Bowery, rather. By the way, the Bowery was the only section of road in New York that did not have one church. I think about that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so Kit Burns' Rat Pit was a pit in the middle of the bar where uh, terriers would fight rats to the death and you'd bet on the terrier or you bet on the rats this is a, a, an artist's conception of a terrier going at the rats the rats would these were giant wharf rats by the way these are not uh, apartment dwelling rats these are the size of hunley's cats um these rats were literally three four feet long and the terrier you would bet on how fast 
the terrier could kill how many rats. And I think the record was like a hundred and three and a half minutes by some famous terrier um, who killed that many rats within an X amount of time. So people would bet on this, but then they had uh, that evolved to dog fights. It evolved to co cock fights. It also had dog versus dog, dog versus rat, rat versus rat. But my favorite was dog versus bear. And they would bring, they eventually had to do away with it because they couldn't keep getting bears from upstate New York. <laughs> they would bring down a bear and it was dog versus bear. Imagine going into a bar today. This is a dog fight in Kit Burns' rat pit. Yeah, uh, that's a regular, that still goes on today in East LA. So, I mean, uh, we know certain quarterbacks who were involved in that in the NFL who actually went to prison. So, yeah, and then got a Nike deal afterward. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's really true. That's really true. But anyway, so there's no water that's drinkable uh, in New York. So that means, like the pilgrims, they drank booze. And that meant they were drunk and out of their minds and beating each other up and fighting each other nonstop. Okay, so above 14th Street are mansions of the Shemahorns, uh, all the wealthy families, the, the, the Vanderbilts. They all have mansions up there. But down below... All of these Irishmen who are coming in and they're unskilled, military age, you can join up for the Civil War. Now, this keep on this. I'm jumping ahead a little bit to 1860. Within a year, they'd shave off four years, Eric, for you to get a citizenship mm -hmm. and you could get it in a year. Uh, and if that was not, if you lived. I mean, obviously, yeah, you had to live. <laughs> well, well I mean, there, there was that little problem. <laughs> But keep in mind, there were gangs in Ireland. So when they came over, it wasn't unusual for them to form gangs, not unlike what we're seeing now out of Costa Rica, out of South San Salvador. MS-13. MS-13 is the same as the Bowery Boys. It's the same as the Dead Rabbits. It's exactly the same. These are hordes of immigrants who came over. There's no apartments. They just keep putting them in alleyways downtown. They're living on fire escapes. I mean, look at this. This is uh, 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 Crow's Alley or something down there. These are a brickback alley. I forget the name of this thing. Uh, it's kind of a murderer's row alley where they just hit you over the head and robbed you. Now, among the criminal class, which is all these people, they had all different kinds of people. They had the pickpockets. They had the droppers. The droppers began to use chloral hydrate back in like the 1840s. And one of the strangest things I saw were the pirate river gangs. This is separate from the gangs of New York. They don't even cover this. The river gangs are completely different and operate on the west sides. The Daybreak Boys, the Buckos, the Hookers, the, the uh, um, uh, Swamp Angels, the Shirt Tails, the Patsy Conroys. This is a whole world of criminal pirate gangs that operated when ships came in. So they, uh, here's how it worked. You got into one of these flea bag hotels on the west side of Manhattan, lower west side of Manhattan. The ship comes in. You may be coming in from the Philippines. You go into this uh, bar. You go to the hotel. They come into the hotel, into your bedroom, and stab you to death and rob you. Un underneath the bed is a trap door that goes right into the river. That's how convenient this is. They literally push a lever. The bottom opens up, and you go into the river, never to be seen from again. There was a woman named Shakespeare uh, who was a local figure down there, and she had memorized all of Shakespeare's works. She could do anything uh, um, from, for, if you gave her like five cents, she would do any Shakespearean play, right? Turns out she gets chopped up, and people believe that she was chopped up by Jack the Ripper because the New York City police had bragged that if the Ripper was in New York, uh, he wouldn't have lasted a week. They would have caught him. So there's rumors, and there's some substantiation to this, that the Ripper actually came over, killed this woman, Shakespeare, to make a statement, then went back to London to do the rest of his killing. Uh, hmm. I don't know if it's true, but there, that's been an urban legend in New York for almost two centuries now. Yeah, there's also questions. Um, some people think that the Ripper could have been H.H. H. Holmes, who yep. went on to the World's Fair in Chicago and built that house that... Well, the efficiency you just described made me think of the Holmes house in Chicago where he had all the rooms. Right. Well, this was in New York. Yeah, this yeah. is in, it might have been designed by him the same way. And of course, the, the center of, of the five points was the old brewery. 
The old brewery was this five-story tall, ramshackle old brewery that was built in 1792. I think it closed in like 1837 uh, as a brewery. But it began, you see it in the movie in Gangs of New York. You see where where the opening is in that. It's completely built uh, by the uh, brilliant designer. Yeah, there it is. It was five stories high. But inside was just a web of, of, uh, of, of floors and and different little spaces and people lived in like three square feet. It, it went down three stories below that uh, where people lived. There were thousands of people living in that structure. Uh, wow. Yeah, when you got off the boat, you went right to that old brew and people wouldn't leave. They wouldn't leave because they were afraid they'd lose their spot inside the place. So I, nobody knows to this day how they got food or ate because if you left, somebody took your little corner. Uh, hmm. And you see it at the beginning of the very beginning of Gangs in New York is inside, com- completely designed by the Italian designer uh, who worked with uh, um, uh, Scorsese on the movie. Uh, and, and they're all up there on these little levels and everything else up there. But on the Bowery side, you had the group called the Bowery Boys. And this is where you'll see Bill the Butcher, and we'll get into this a little later. The Bowery Boys, or the True Blue Americans, or the Atlantic Guard, or the American Guard, they dressed in a different way than the Dead Rabbits. They, th- these guys were dressed to the nines. These were not poor people. These people here, the Bowery Boys themselves, had these brilliant red shirts, top hats, uh, boots, and these suspenders and these pants and these long draped jackets. And the red shirt was because all of them were involved in the volunteer fire department. Every single gang had a volunteer fire department that they worked for. It was a badge of honor and not just a badge of honor. uh, 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 Even, even uh, boss Tweed, I think I forget his name was big six or something was the name of his um, uh, fire department. Big Six, yeah. Uh, they each had a fire company. There were no horses. You had to, you know, you had to pull the the uh, thing, Eric, you know, with the uh, water in it, and you mm. would get to the fire, and fires had to be put out immediately because everything was made of wood down there. Sure. Okay, so it was crazy. So you get to the fire. Now, what happens at the fire? Another fire company shows up, and then it's on. No, no, then it's on, right? Okay, so there was a group called the Plug Uglies. That was one of the gangs. Now, the Plug Uglies had hats that were called plugs. And in that hat, it was like a smushed down top hat that you put metal and wire in that so nobody could club you over the head. So it was a smushed up hat with metal and, and tin in there and everything else. The Plug Uglies would show up, and the plug that we're talking about the plug uglies is the fire plug. So they would take an empty barrel, a 55 gallon drum barrel, turn it over onto the fire plug and sit on it. So nobody could get to the water from that uh, uh, fire plug. And they would fight to each other while the buildings were burning. And then they would go in and loot the buildings. It was a tradition as old as time that goes all the way into the New York city fire department because I had friends, especially Frank Foy, if you're still out there, who told me in a million occasions, everything goes in the boots. And you firemen out there know what I'm talking about. To this day, in New York City, everything that on you can get access to inside of an apartment building fire goes into your boots. And then what happens with the boots, Eric? You get back to the firehouse, everyone dumps their boots out on the table and you split up the booty and you go to Grand Union and you buy a giant ham or beer or whatever you need. Don't tell me that's where the term booty came from. Yeah, that's where the term booty came from. Yeah, it came from the pirates, Uh, but it it expanded into firemen. And this is New York City firemen that I knew in the 80s doing this still. And this goes back to, to Boss Tweed and his group. So some of these traditions never disappeared. Okay, so you go, what's in it? What's in it for the gangs? Every gang has a fire department, a fire hose department, right? Mm -hmm. Insurance companies would pay whoever got there first. They would give a Mm -hmm. check. The the insurance companies would give a check to the group that put out the freaking fire. So they'd be punching each other in the face. The money didn't go to them individually. It went to the firehouse. And then again, 
They used the money to buy liquor and food and party uh, stuff. So it was essential that each gang have a fire company. So it's essentially a Cobra effect. Where they're trying to, we're going to reward whoever gets there first and puts out the fire. Problem yeah. is that people take that and they run with it and they make sure that they're the ones to put out the fire and things burn down. Oh, oh no, they burn so down all it, the time. It, yeah. You know, live unintended consequences. Yeah, uh, they burn down all the time. And they were there were fires in New York, 1837, with a whole city almost burned to the ground. I mean, they, they these there were massive, massive fires in New York City. Uh, and and they, sometimes they'd have to use dynamite to to stop the flow of the fire, Eric. They'd blow up some buildings uh, to keep it from spreading, that type of things. But the red shirts and pants uh, that you see in the stovepipe hat is 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 what they wore. At, that was their fire company, the Bowery Boys. And this is what's demonstrated right here. That shirt is part of their fire company. I uh, forget the number of Bill the Butcher's fire company, but he... Um, he was also he was the head of his own fire company, Bill the Butcher. Now, Bill the Butcher, uh, a.k.a. Bill Poole, who you see as Daniel Day Lewis in the movie, uh, not only is he six feet tall, he's over 200 pounds and he's one of the most famous fighters in the five points. Now he comes. He's a New Jersey asshole. He's like Bill Maher. He comes from Sussex, New Jersey, where his family had a butcher shop and he opens up a butcher shop down in the village. And he becomes a knife expert uh, because of his butchering skills. When I say knife expert, I mean, there are times in theaters where Bill uh, Poole, Bill the Butcher, would put on a knife throwing show like you would see in a circus where a human being stood there and he tossed knives at them, skinning their ears. What you see with, with uh, um, I want to say Cameron Diaz, but... Um, is it Cameron Diaz in the movie? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you see her uh, uh, being nicked by the knives. That is that. Here's a shot of Bill Poole. Now, he's also a professional boxer. All of these guys have three or four things in common. Uh, this is, they are politicians. They run their own fire companies. They're gang leaders and they're boxers. There's Tough four things. nails. Right, but they all have yeah. four things in common. I'm talking about on the Democratic side, the Republican yeah. side. Uh, the Whigs in this case, or the Know Nothings, or the, the Nativists, they are uh, not just gang members. I, I can't make this out clear enough. They are gang members, and they do have their own gangs, and they are super violent, and they are criminals. No doubt about it. They rob, they loot, they pillage, they do everything else you can imagine. But they're also politicians. They're also the head of their fire companies, and they're also boxers. And you're going to meet another guy named Morrissey. Now, John Morrissey is on the Democratic side of this operation. Uh, Bill the Butcher, by the way, will run for office. I think he uh, lost, he becomes a ward leader in the Sixth Ward, which is where the five points were. It's called the Sixth Ward. Uh, but he will run for office and lose as a state senator. Now, keep in mind, this is really crazy. There's so much that's crazy in this thing, I can't even explain it to you. There's a police department, right? And the police department is called the Municipal Police Department. It's so corrupt, it's run by Boss Tweed. So he owns the police department. He, they do whatever he says. The governor of New York creates his own police department, his Boss Tweed. The governor of New York, because of the corruption in New York City, begins to screw around with New York City. And they begin to use their muscle up in, in, in first it's Kingston, New York. Uh, and Kingston, New York is is about, I, I want to say, 90 miles outside of New York, right up the Hudson River, right by Bard College. Kingston, New York, is considered too close to the corruption in New York. So they moved the state capital to Albany, New York, simply to get it further away from New York and corruption, which is a side story. It's very so funny. that's why it's so damn far uh, yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They moved it from Kingston, which was the original New York state capital, to get away from the corruption of the city. Anyway, so the governor of New York creates his own police department and gives them a constitution and bylaws to operate in, the, in New York City. Now you've got, this is unbelievable, you've got two competing police departments in New York, and this is for Al Gonzalez, because I know he knows this, and every cop in New York knows this. There was the municipal police department, and there was the metropolitan police department, and they would have massive fistfights and go to arrest people and turn each other's criminals loose. 
for a period of time before this was resolved and there was one police department, there were two police departments in New York City who were at each other's throats. How long did that go on? For a number of years. It also happens into the uh, draft riots uh, where they're still going during the draft riots. But we're going to get into that in a little while. The um, the the rabbits, the de- this is Morrissey, by the way. Morrissey is the arch enemy of Bill the Butcher, Bill Poole. Morrissey is also a professional boxer. He's also going to be a state senator. He's also going to be a bar owner, uh, not numerous bars, Irish bars. He's from Troy, New York. He comes down from Troy, uh, I think a first or second generation Irish immigrant. And he comes down and he begins to fight, uh, have a fight with Bill Poole. This will eventually lead to some bad uh, results for uh, uh, for both of them, actually, but more for Bill, more for Bill Poole. Uh, 1853, Poole was appointed to rep the sixth ward uh, by the by the new mayor. There was a guy, uh, Fernando Wood, who ran for mayor in uh, I think it was in 1853 during the draft riots, and uh, uh, that guy is in charge of these the the dead rabbits. Uh, is this Fernando Wood? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He becomes mayor of New York. Now he's beholden. He's beholden to um, to Tammany Hall. So he's not like completely independent. But keep in mind, these gangs have a thousand members each, uh, roughly. These gangs and 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 there are gangs out there um, like the Plug Uglies, like I was talking about, and and they each are attached to a politician. So when when the election happens, when things are are uh, um, happening. They will destroy the mail-in ballots of the opposition. They will destroy the ballot boxes of the opposition. Uh, Bill, the, Bill the Butcher and his group will stand in front of the ballot, uh, uh, the voting center, and beat the living crap out of anyone who's going in there, just stopping them from voting. And the dead rabbits would do that on the other side. This is uh, obviously Daniel Day-Lewis. They would use a blue accent on their color scheme. The dead rabbits used a red one, not unlike the Crips and the Bloods 150 years later. This is so you would know who's on your side during a riot. And they had riots. And I'm not talking about gang wars. I'm talking about riots where there's 5,000 on 5,000 fighting for days in the streets of New York, where the police would put up barricades and reinforcements would come in. And these these fights would go on for days. And then they would loot the stores around them. I mean, the, these there was the anti-abolition riot in 1834, the Astor Place riot, which was about Shakespeare, by the way. The Astor Place riot was in the Astor Theater. Uh, the giraffe riots of 1863, uh, there was a guy named Horace Greeley, the famous journalist who worked at the Tribune. Um, this is, yeah. The police, I, this, the police riot. This is between the two police forces. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, okay. They get a, a warrant to arrest uh, the mayor, and the mayor refuses to go. Uh, So this police force comes in, and the the Metropolitan Police comes in to arrest uh, uh, Fernando Wood, and the municipal police are defending him. So they start a fight, and they're duking it out nonstop, the two police forces, right at City Hall, nonstop. So the 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 uh, state's version, the state has the, the Metropolitan Police Force, They run into an armed regiment of the Union Army that is marching to a boat to go down to fight uh, General Lee. And they said, you got to help us here, bro. And they go, what is it? He goes, this guy is in the thing. We've got a warrant for his arrest. So now the uh, municipal police force is being fought by the Metropolitan Police Force and the Union Army. This is separate from the draft riots. This is completely separate. Now, the Metropolitan was the governor's, and the municipal is the ones that were there. The municipal right? belonged to the mayor. The Metropolitan belonged to the governor. Yeah. Okay. So they cited state constitutional law, and they got the Union Army Regiment to back them up and went in and arrested the guy, finally, uh, for the mayor of New York, uh, who refused to budge. I mean, these things were insane. Uh, getting you know, getting uh, the, into these theaters... Uh, they operated these theaters on the Bowery. And I'm talking about theaters 
where entire gangs would go to the theater and know every line of Shakespeare, Eric. The gangs would know every line. And you think, well, how long can this happen? Well, here's the old Bowery Theater. The new Bowery Theater held 3,000 people. And they would put on events. I, I, this is going to be hard to explain. So I'm going to just going to tell you what they did. They put on gigantic mega plays, which would lead to mega movies. When the first movies came out and they had like Cecil B. DeMille style movies with huge sets and huge things, that came from these plays on the Bowery of these huge theaters. They put on, I'll just give you an example of some of the plays they put on. The Last Days of Pompeii, The Earthquake, uh, uh, Tank Dramas with Pirates, The Battle of Waterloo, where a hundred horses are on stage with 300 soldiers reenacting the Battle of Waterloo, okay? The Earthquake had the stage shaking and the entire theater shaking using mechanical devices. The Last Days of Pompeii had exploding volcanoes with lava Jeez. No, no, these were huge, huge. I don't mean little tiny things. This is where mega films, giant films came from when they created movies. Even in the silent films, they started, especially in France, they started to create these colossal films. It came from these theater things. This is why the gangs went, because they were the equivalent of the movie Titanic. They were the equivalent of giant movies that we will see later on, event movies. Amazing. They were raking in $10,000 a week in the 1850s uh, at the box office for these events. That is insane. Totally insane. Totally insane. But that being said, the dead rabbits were, uh, and there's some Gaelic version, there's different versions of how they got the name. But the dead rabbits is from Gaelic dead rabbit, which means a big galoot in, in Gaelic. Uh, and when they saw the dead rabbits, they would go into battle with dead rabbits on spears, stuck up on their spears. And you see some of that in the movie. They're living in the old brewery. And you see this guy, Valone, who's played by Liam Neeson. Uh, this is Priest Valone, uh, made up character by, uh, by Jay Cox. But the 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 uh, DiCaprio character, I believe, is a version of uh, of this guy that I, Morrissey that you just showed, John Morrissey, and hmm. he becomes like DiCaprio does in the movie, the arch nemesis. Uh, this is Morrissey. Now Morrissey's also six feet tall. He's also a pugilist. He's the arch nemesis of of, of Bill the Butcher, and I think that's where they got the DiCaprio character from. Uh, I'm not completely sure, but it's there's too many overlaps of the DiCaprio character. Now he fictionalizes a lot of this stuff, but oh yeah, like, uh, the real um, Bill the Butcher was dead seven years before the draft riots. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like and, the, and the draft riots didn't happen in the winter; they happened in July of 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 of, uh, of uh, '63 uh, in the summer and July 11th, and that, those go on for four nights. But yeah, Bill the Butcher uh, he dies at the age of 33 uh, in 1855. Uh, March 3rd. Now, we'll get into his murder because it's going to be through a contract killing by Morrissey. Uh, interestingly enough, Morrissey brings in three of his guys who will kill uh, Bill. De this is an artist rendition. This becomes the biggest story at that time in New York history because Bill the Butcher is that big. He's that large. That card, there was a card I, I sh you, you, you may have used for the thumbnail. There was like baseball cards with Bill the Butcher on it. That that thing that you used, uh, yeah, that that is actually like a baseball card uh, made for the cigarette company, uh, Laurelard, a uh, long cut tobacco of a gang member. As crazy, <laughs> it's, it's a you know, I mean, it's crazy. Well, he's an athlete too, so I mean, yeah. that I didn't realize it, but they made cigarette cards before they made. Um, bubblegum cards. Yeah. The bubblegum was a change after a uh, Pittsburgh Steeler player sued to not be on a cigarette card or something. Yeah, I think it was uh, Honus Wagner to be, to, if I could go back and think about it. But the um, the height of the draft rise, which we're going to get into in a second, because what happens with the, with the creation of conscription, the Irish came over here, and a lot of immigrants came over here to avoid forced conscription. 
And all of a sudden, they've been subject to forced conscription by Lincoln. They didn't see that coming. In fact, nobody saw it coming because they didn't know the war was going to last this long, Eric. Uh, in 1861 into 1862, and then the conscription into 1863, uh, people have had it. But what they really flipped out about was one particular factor. And that was the fact you could buy your way out for 300 bucks. That blew people's minds because this allowed wealthy people to spend $300 or, or give the 300 to a guy to replace you. You could either give the 300 up or find a guy, give him the 300. So it was a two-way thing. But either way, the Irish flipped out. And the Irish didn't care about or know anything about slavery uh, slavery had been gone from New York since 1827, way before the Irish got here. They mm. didn't know what the point of the war was. It wasn't their dog in the hunt. They didn't care about it. Uh, some of them obviously joined to get advanced citizenship, but they died. Uh, every day you opened up the New York Times and there was a list of dead Irishmen who fought in some place uh, uh, far south to wherever you've ever been. They, most of these Irishmen never got off the island of Manhattan their entire lives, Eric. You know what I mean? So you had a situation here where every time the, the society or deep state or the wealthy people in Manhattan tried to force their will socially on the great unwashed masses, they rioted. That's all they had to, as a weapon was to go berserk and riot. Uh, uh, keep in mind, there are organizations where there's 2,000 members in your gang, Eric. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And And... You know, like I said, the Bowery boys had legitimate jobs. The the dead rabbits, not so much. The Irish, but the Protestants really had uh, legitimate jobs. You know, they were policemen, they were firemen, they were uh, uh, you know merchants, they were things of that nature. The Irish, not so much. But I, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, I was gonna say there's a great Boss Quee tweet quote about that though, or somebody attributed it to him. Um, Make sure you keep half of the poor fighting the other half. Right. There's also an extension of that quote, uh, which uh, Shemahorn says in the movie, uh, and, he, and he says it came from Boss Tweed in a scene where they're playing pool. Mm -hmm. And Boss Tweed says you can always pay half of the poor to kill That's the other it. half of the poor. I, yeah. I, I, I've heard both. But um, in 1855, there's over 30,000 gang members in New York alone. Think about that. Uh, the, the amount of police, 1,600. Yeah. Think I, about I that. Stay out of the way. <laughs> right. So when they have these, the, the reason the New York City police was so effective, and we could talk about this with Al Gonzalez and some of the other cops who are going to show up at the meetup in Youngstown, they were able to grid out New York and block it off professionally where 1,600 cops could hold off 10,000 rioters. And this was because of the, the grid of New York. They were able to box them in using saw horses and, and, and horses and uh, the grid of New York, which is are a bunch of squares, and be able to fight them. It, it, in the, when you read the details of the 1863 draft riots, the heroism that goes on with these cops, uh, it's just breathtaking. They're, they're, in, in the 1863 draft riot, which starts out simply because the head of the fire department, one of these fire companies, gets called as one of the first draft members. They call out Jeffrey O'Shaughnessy, and he flips out O'Shaughnessy, whoever he was, I forget. And they attack the draft center, the draft where the numbers are coming out of a barrel, Eric. Mm -hmm. they, they go in there and they smash that and they set it on fire. And that they have no plan to riot. This evolves naturally out of this pent-up emotion of not wanting to go fight in this civil war where hundreds of thousands are dying on a weekly basis. They do not want to go. And they burn the draft center down to the ground. The telegraph goes crazy. The details of the battle of the uh, draft riots are insane. It goes on for four days and four nights. They try to get into the armory on 21st Street to get all the guns. They get into the armory. The police seal off the armory. And when each guy comes out of the hole in the armory, the cops are in the armory. The cops go out the back door or a hole in the wall in the armory, the, the, the Union armory. They escape the cops. They're trapped in there by the mob. There's 20,000 people outside. 20,000. Think about this. Think, hmm. you, you want to talk about George Floyd? You want to talk about Chaz and Chop up there where there's a handful of Antifa? This was a mob of 20,000 people. In fact, 
there were mobs all around the city uh, in groups of 1,000, 2,000 apiece. They were lynching blacks that they could get their hands on. I think they killed about eight or nine blacks. They went into the children's black orphanage and burned that to the ground as you know, because they were so upset with having to fight for these blacks in the South. Uh, they were losing their shit, but what, they just began looting everything. They went uptown, started looting the mansions on Fifth Avenue. Uh, these people had some arms, they had some rifles, uh, but they were overwhelmed by the sheer number of people. It was a, it was a mismatch. The Total cops mismatch. sound like it was another battle of Thermopylae. Let me tell you something. These cops, I don't know how they did it, but a, a movie should be just be made or a documentary just about the cops, how they handled this riot, the Metropolitan Police how they were able to handle the draft riots because they, a lot of cops lost their lives. A lot of them lost their skulls. A lot of them lost arms and limbs and everything else. I mean, it was brutal, Eric, brutal. The entire city's on fire. They're looting everything left and right. They finally get off a telegraph to Lincoln saying we need help. And Lincoln orders the men to come from the battlefield of Gettysburg to literally... Oh, wow. Eric, this is unbelievable. To literally <laughs> stop fighting, General Lee, turn around, get on ships, and come back to Manhattan to shoot and kill over 2,000 New Yorkers in cold blood at gunpoint and bayonet point. Nobody knows about the draft riots in New York. We learned them in school in New York. Not everybody did. I was in a special school, uh, some advanced school, but I've been fascinated by this my entire life. Scorsese covers part of it, but he, the draft riots are way past Bill the Butcher's <laughs> life. So it doesn't really make sense as a movie because Bill the Butcher dies in 1855 and the draft riots are, are sure. eight, eight years later. But he takes license with that, which is fine. I don't care about that. But I mean, literally having to leave the Battle of Gettysburg to fight this, uh, 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 to kill 2,000 New Yorkers who are looting and going crazy and the city's about to go under. It was the biggest riot in American history. Never been close. Nothing ever been like it. Lincoln called it, ready for this? An insurrection. He called it an insurrection. Wow. Well, I mean, uh, considering how many people are involved, how many people were not actually born citizens or yep. not citizens yep. yet. Um, yep. I mean, I'm sure Governor Abbott, he's calling it an insurrection. Invasion. Right. Uh, again, so. this was not a, a, a wild mob. They had political purpose. They went after the media. They made a beeline for the Tribune newspaper, who was fanning the flames of the Civil War for three freaking years. Just like CNN, just like MSNBC. They went to the offices of Horace Greeley and, and went to the Tribune, but the Tribune was waiting for them. What did the Tribune do? They melted down all their uh, uh, metal letters that they would use in the printing press, Eric, and they poured hot boiling lead from the third and second floor windows of the Tribune offices in New York onto the heads of the uh, rioters, melting them with hot lead. All right, I got to correct something really quickly. What? Mark never said General Lee went to New York Why City. Even, he said they stopped don't even fighting time. Lee. Stop, don't, to go there. don't even waste our time, Eric. We, we got another agenda here. Anyway, so you've got this police force is now being backed up. You've got this this riot going on. The dead the dead rabbits had fought the Bowery Boys in uh, in 57, 1857. They had they had their own battle with them that went on for days. And now the reason I'm mentioning it is. The two gangs combined, Eric. That's what the gangs of New York really was. The Dead Rabbits and the Bowery Boys all realized that they had the same axe to grind, and it was with the federal government and with Lincoln. And that's why they joined forces and they looted everything in sight. And they, the, the real battle for the armory is really where the turning point happens. And if you can get into the literature, there's there's articles and literature. You can read into the New York Times Um the stories of, of the heroism and the brilliance of the Metropolitan Police, how they suckered the mob into coming in and getting the guns. And they circled around to the front and there was one tiny little exit door where they had broken in, the mob had broken in. And when each one of them came out of that tiny little door, Eric, each mob guy, they were clubbed to death by the Metropolitan Police with their billy clubs. Their skulls were cracked open and they were murdered 
uh, and killed right then and there as they climbed out of this tiny little hole that they had created to break into the armory. Uh, they formed a gauntlet of like 100 cops, and you had to run this gauntlet to get out with the weapons. And they, when they broke into the armory, they thought there, there was the greatest day of their lives. They grabbed every brand new rifle and, and pistol, uh, the, the, the cult, uh, that beautiful cult that had just come out, the, the Navy cult uh, hmm. was brand new in there. Uh, and they grabbed those colts and they grabbed the rifles and tons of ammo and they just stuffed them in their pockets. But when they had to go out through that hole onto 21st Street, the police were waiting for them. They broke their skulls open. Wow. Yeah. Balls yeah. move and risk yeah. move. Well, uh, too, dude, it was just an... letting them arm up. Well, so this they, they let them arm up because and they escaped out the back right. and went yeah. around to the front. Dude, it, it's so brilliant what they did. I mean, but they had they had had a bunch of riots, so I think they kind of knew how to deal with some riots. Uh, they they got the commissioner of police. They they killed him. They grabbed him when he was going down the street with a cane. He didn't end up too well. Amazing. But let me get into this, um, the killing of Poole, because this is 1855. Poole doesn't get to see these draft riots, and I wanted to explain what happened with, with Bill Poole. Bill Poole was at the Stanwix Hotel. The Stanwix was a brand new place on Broadway. Um, this is the shooting of Poole. He had beaten Morrissey and beaten some others to a pulp. He was so violent. He would, like you see in the movie, he would bite your ear off. He would beat you into a pulp. Uh, 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 he was a guy who, who had amazing strength and he, these three guys came into the Stanwix hotel that night into the bar, spit in his face. And they were, they were goading him, uh, to, uh, to, uh, respond, which he didn't respond unless it was for money. Like some, it was kind of like, I guess the wild West where people wanted to draw on you. You know what I mean? Like you're the fastest gun sure. and, and sure. right. See, I mean, you turned it down and he would turn it down all the time because there were always guys picking fights with him who were drunk and he would, he would take out like $300 and go put down $300 and let's go, you know, I'll meet you somewhere. And he missed a couple of times with Morrissey, but Morrissey had been beaten by uh, Bill Poole and Morrissey wanted revenge, just like DiCaprio wants revenge against Bill Poole and the gangs in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, Morrissey, of course, is, is enmeshed in Democratic politics, and they're stealing elections left and right, uh, the Democrats, out of Tammany Hall. And Bill the Butcher and his group are not happy about it. And they, you know, they really wanted to bring this thing to a head, which is why the, the 1857 riots were so important. But what happens is this guy named Baker, who's hired by Morrissey, uh, gets goes like this. He pulls out which I think was a Navy Colt, and he puts it on his arm like this to shoot him like this. And he hmm. shoots himself in the arm, which was not good. And he's rolling around on the ground, but he takes the Colt and he shoots uh, uh, Bill the Butcher in the leg and then gets a shot into his heart. Uh, Bill the Butcher still starts getting up and stabbing him anyway, because uh, that's the kind of guy Bill the Butcher was. So he's got a shot in the heart and he's taken down to Christopher Street where he lived and he lives with a bullet in his heart for 14 days, 14 days he lives. And they can't find the bullet because it's whatever happened happens, right? He finally dies March 18th, 1855. And they, the New York Times covers this. He has the biggest funeral that New York had ever seen with five to 10,000 people following it. That's, that's obviously in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Uh, that's where Bill the Pool, Bill William Poole left his, his marker, and uh, and that's where he is to this day. You could go over there now and see that if you wanted to. It must be covered with snow because of the <laughs> the, the, the weather in New York. But the New York Times covered this. Every paper in New York covered this, and they begin to look for Baker. Baker flees to New Jersey. Uh, he gets on a boat, goes to New Jersey, gets on a, a steamship and goes to the Canary Islands. This is Baker, the killer. Oh, no, yeah, you didn't know about this, did you, Hanley? So <laughs> Baker's on a ship speeding towards the Canary Islands, and one of the benefactors of the, of the Know Nothing Party, uh, uh, the nativist, has a gigantic clipper sailboat, one of the fastest sailboats in New York, another millionaire, and he says, I can head him off. 
and they race down towards the Canary Islands and they get Baker and they intercept the boat and they put him in irons and they bring him back to New York to stand trial. Hmm. And they capture Baker, the assassin of uh, Bill the Butcher, who will stand trial in three, tri three uh, trials and eventually be acquitted after three trials. He, and he walks. Uh, oh, that's Baker, right. Yeah, Baker walked on that. Yeah, because they, they uh, three jurors hung, I think, mm -hmm. on each of them or something like that, right? Yeah. So he had three trials, but he, he, he gets away with murder. And this is 1855. So keep in mind, the, the, the death of Bill the Butcher leaves a power vacuum in New York and also with the Bowery Boys, which is why the dead rabbits have that riot and battle with the Bowery Boys in 1857 trying to take control of the city, which they do, which they do. The Bowery Boys will never reach the height of their power after the death of Bill the Butcher because the dead rabbits combined with Boss Tweed will take over the city with the Irish completely lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. And Morrissey, what happened with him on it, though? Because he was accused of the murder, too, or the contract. Morrissey went on to become a multimillionaire. He oh. opened... He, he okay. opened yeah, he, Morrissey goes on to become... Uh, a, a totally wealthy guy. He, uh, bare knuckle boxer, blah, blah, blah. He becomes a member of the New York State Senate in uh, 1878. And then uh, he goes into business. He opens up a bunch of bars and his nickname was Old Smoke. And he wins the heavyweight championship of the world in California in 1852. Uh, I mean, th this guy... Um, is really the DiCaprio character. And I, I think they avoided it because he's got a lot of living relatives. Mm. I, I think they avoided it for, for legal pur purposes. But I always thought it was ma uh, modeled after John Morrissey, the uh, nemesis to build a butcher. Was Morrissey younger too? Or I didn't, if there was an uh, age. Difference? He was born in eight, eight well, let me see, he was born in... Um, 1831 in Ireland, and he ends up in Saratoga Springs, where he died at the age of 47 in 1878, Eric. Um, hmm. So, yeah, yeah, but, he would be younger, I think, because Bill yeah. the Butcher was 33 when he died and 57. So that In 1866, been... Morrissey runs for Congress with the backing of Tabany Hall, despite his political rivals pointing out his numerous indictments and some convictions of various crimes, he becomes a U.S. congressman and serves <laughs> two terms only, 1867 to 1871, in the House, in the 40th and 41st United States Congress. As a congressman, he always looked out for the interests of the Irish and was known to use strong-arm tactics, beating them down to accomplish legislative goals, at one point allegedly declaring he could lick any man in the House of Representatives. All right? All right. <laughs> okay. So he eventually grew tired of Tammany Hall, left the House after a second term. He testified against Boss Tweed. Boss Tweed will eventually go to jail because of uh, the Tweed courthouse, where a feather duster inside the Tweed courthouse was $11,000. It was so corrupt that it, this is uh, uh, Thomas Nast's famous cartoons of Boss Tweed. Thomas Nast, the cartoonist was single-handedly responsible, even to Boss Tweed, to bringing down Boss Tweed. Because uh, Boss Tweed went to see Thomas Nast, and he famously told him, my followers can't read, but they're able to understand cartoons. Knock it off. And he didn't. Um, and then, anyway, so yeah, he becomes a New York State Senator, Morrissey, in the 18, uh, 1875, re-elected in 1877. Uh, he dies of pneumonia in 1878 at the age of 47. And that becomes a national holiday, a uh, state holiday uh, based out of Troy. So you, you, these guys are not like Crips and Bloods. I mean, these guys are the most revered politicians of their era in their demographic region, uh, this being New York State. Uh, it's just one of the craziest things, but it shows you how we got here. It shows you how the Democratic Party got control of New York City. If you really want to know, it's because of the Irish and catering to the Irish when they came over with nothing. And it has a lot of similarities to what's going on today, uh, where they're giving them all this stuff and people are yelling, uh, why are you giving them all this stuff? And they're denying it. This goes back to 1850. They've been doing this for a long time. And uh, it's just I just thought it would be of interest to the audience to see where this came from. 
Yeah. By the way, after the Civil War, none of this stuff ever gets reported because it's almost like an entire new civilization has been built out of the ashes of the Civil mm -hmm. War. The Civil War and other commentators have said the Revolutionary War to the Civil War is really the birth of America. Mm -hmm. After the Civil War, it's an entire new civilization. And nobody wants to talk about this period of time from 1840 to 1860. Uh, it just disappears from the history books. And I was always fascinated about it. And a lot of people are because it's just not covered in school. Uh, this particular I mean, the draft riots are obviously an embarrassment. Uh, the killing of Americans leads to the uh, Comatus posse uh, thing where you can't kill your own people, Eric. You know, <laughs> that, that happens uh, 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 by the next president passes that after Lincoln. Uh, either Garfield or someone, I think it might have been Garfield who passes a uh, Comatus uh, Posse, right? I, I don't remember. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, this is a dark period of American history. That's why I think a lot of uh, uh, people don't want to cover it. and But we do, because it's America's untold story. Yeah, a lot of people say the Civil War is the completion of the Revolutionary War. And mm -hmm. also, I think it... I think it, the um, how they broke it down is before the Civil War, it was the United States are, and mm -hmm. after the Civil War, is the United States is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, he says famously, goodbye, boys, I die a true American. Those are the last words of Bill the Butcher. And those mm -hmm. were recorded fairly accurately because there were people at his deathbed for 14 days. Yeah. And that's, that's an interesting thing, and that becomes an American... Uh, 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 slogan at the time for nativist causes, anti-immigration causes. And uh, this was way before they had uh, virtue signaling uh, immigration policies. Now, you sent me one other guy I have a feeling you want to get into. Is this when they combined? No. Well, Monk Eastman is a guy from... No. Okay. So there's, there's Brendan Gleeson, who is the sheriff in the movie. He's called Monk, but he's not called Monk Eastman. Monk Eastman oh. will be part, he'll be, yeah, this is very confusing to people who don't know history. Monk Eastman will be part of Murderer's Row in the 1900s. This is Monk Eastman. Uh, the name of Monk is chosen because of Monk Eastman by Scorsese and Jay Cox. Uh, okay, okay. But it's not Monk Eastman. It's not the, Monk Eastman. This is um, Brendan Gleeson playing a guy, and he looks like him. It's, it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, move on the part of Scorsese to use the Monk Eastman name, but it's it's nowhere near uh, historically accurate. Right, and and didn't Scorsese say that the Gangs of New York was more of an opera than it is a history? Yeah, I mean, yeah, he has said it. I mean, keep in mind, January 1st uh, in 1972, he reads uh, Herbert Asbury's Gangs of New York at a friend's house out on Long Island, and it takes him 30, 30 years to get the movie made. Um, it, it, he because it was so expensive. Even when it is made, there's only one man who can pull it off and get him the eighty-six million dollars that he needs, and that man is Harvey Weinstein. I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's only one man who could do this. And as he's about to finish the movie after thirty years, nine eleven happens, and it can't be released because it's too violent. So he has to put mm. it back on the shelf for another year and a half. And I'll tell you something else. At the end. Uh, when you see the dissolve from uh, the the graveyard um, to the skyline of New York, you see the World Trade Centers, and they 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 tortured him to take it out, Scorsese, and he refused. Oh, he good. refused to remove it. Good. Yeah. I'm glad he did. Yeah, and up until that time, the most Americans who had died were died at Americans' hands of the Union Army in that draft riot of 1863. Uh, they say 2,000, but there's probably a lot more because a lot of the bodies were never recovered. Hmm. Wow. Is the draft riot something that you um, thought about writing as treatment for or screenplay? I couldn't or? because this was, this was in, this was in, had taken up the whole zeitgeist. Hmm. Uh, Gangs in New York covers it. You can't really do anything about it. It's been covered for so long by them. They, uh, there's no wiggle room without covering, stepping on his toes. Well, that sucks. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that they got Daniel Day-Lewis was kind of interesting. Uh, uh, Toby Maguire and DiCaprio had to go beg him to give up his shoemaking career. Yeah, in Italy. He's cobbling. He's cobbling <laughs> and come back and do this. And they knew there was only one guy who could play Bill the Butcher. Everybody knew that. And he just didn't want any part of it. You know, and the movie, uh, you know, it takes a long time to shoot in Italy. They, he stays in character the entire time. He creates this accent. Almost dies. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he puts in the... The glass eye, 
with the American Eagle, and he's able to develop a non-blinking ability to tap it with a butcher knife. I mean, yeah. just crazy, crazy stuff that goes on in this movie. Uh, the accuracy is impeccable of the sets mm -hmm. um, and, and the costuming. Here's another weird thing. Got 10 Academy Award nominations and won zero. Zero. Yeah, that, that was... Um... I'll tell you something else. This guy shows up named George Lucas. And Lucas shows up to visit the set. He was working on Star Wars. That's right. Yeah. And he says, uh, you're never going to do this again. No one's ever going to do this again. It's a waste of money. It's never going to happen. And he says, what do you mean? He goes, well, you could CGI the whole goddamn thing. You spent $86 million on nothing. I could have done this for 10 bucks. And he goes, what? He says, yeah. And he says, what, what's missing now? And he goes, I don't know. I just need an elephant. He goes, it's on me. The only CGI thing in the entire gangs of New York is an elephant that es escapes Barnum and Bailey circus and is running down the streets of Manhattan. And that's CGI by George Lucas as a gift to Marty Scorsese. That was well done CGI because I had no <laughs> yeah. idea. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I really didn't have Nobody an idea knows. on that. Nobody knows that. But um, yeah, that, that's kind of a, a shame. I, I remember that when he said, yeah, this is the past, this is the future, and this is the grounds of it. But that, it is kind of sad. I, I miss real effects and i think they're starting to come back well i mean you they, they did use green screen for the back of the ships so you just see sky back there at least uh green That's screen cool. has been as old as hollywood itself so hmm. there is some green screening going on but those sets are insane uh the amount of money that went into those sets and that's why nobody would make the movie for 35 years because of the uh how expensive the sets were and everything else but um yeah, they have two half ships there where the Irish are coming off. Uh, just unbelievable. The streets and everything are impeccable. And and Scorsese said the more it rained, the muddier it got, the fatter the pigs got. It was better as time went on in Italy. <laughs> that sounds like complete madness. And yeah, and Daniel Day-Lewis seems like a maniac. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you look at him, I mean, look at the character. He had done The Age of Innocence with Scorsese eight, seven or eight years before. Mm -hmm. And it was the same time period, but uptown New York with Winona Ryder and Michelle Pfeiffer. Amazing. That's what I would pick. But this this week's movie pick has got to be right here, The Gangs of New York. I mean, just absolute history on screen, you know, with some license, but it's not a documentary. And you're allowed to do that as a filmmaker, as Oliver Stone has told me, and as Scorsese uh, said before. Well, and I, I think he never claimed it, and that's why he got um, so much credit on the screenplay, because it was so completely rewritten from the original work that... They, you're talking could... about the Scorsese one? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Steve yeah. Zalian comes in. It's originally Jay Cox, who was a magazine film critic. Uh, Steve Zalian comes in, and then two other additional writers come in. After that, there's a lot of writers on the film because it, it it went through a lot of different drafts. In fact, he screened the film 34 different cuts uh, before it was even uh, finalized and, and locked picture. Uh, had 34 different screenings. Came The original length of the film was almost four hours. Mm, okay, well, that makes sense then because I saw an interview he did with Charlie Rose and Daniel Day-Lewis, and he said that there is no director's cut. That mm. is the cut. Yeah. It, it, period. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's no changes, anything else. And I yeah. sort of appreciated that as well, that he was like, this is it. There's no no variance on that. Well, he worked with Thelma Schoonmacher, um, who, ironically, uh, he worked for uh, when he was a second or third editor on an obscure documentary called Woodstock. Really? Yeah. <laughs> he, he was. One, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, that is crazy. That is crazy. Uh, directed by Michael Wadley, of course. Um, one of the great documentaries of all time. All right. Well, you know what? We were demonetized immediately on the video. Well, yeah. what else is no talking so. about the draft riots? Sure. Why talk about American history? Yeah, I can't have that. But fortunately, we have people here who are giving us super chats it's and trying to help us out. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, UW Thai IGH. I grew up in Anover township new jersey mm -hmm. we played in that old nazi van camp and found uh, nazi uh, paraphernalia yeah. my yeah. mother was appalled and burned all the shit we found yeah thank you that's absolutely true we covered that obviously in the other episode uh about the uh, nazis in america um yeah especially in new jersey there was a lot of that going on and bill the butcher was from new jersey he's from sussex county 
Um, and uh, his father had a butchery, a butcher shop there, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you ran butcher shops, you had food to give out as cocaine, as gifts. Wow, it's amazing. Uh, Kim Opperman with nine ninety nine. No, Kim. And Kim uh, nine ninety nine again. Double barrel action. And then Kim here actually said a note this round. Um, got off my fat ass about my Youngstown <laughs> ticket, taking bow to Mark. And Thank uh, you. And Kim did talk to me about it and said, "That's funny." Hey, um, Mark's, you know, really got under my skin on this. So. Dude, I'm well, joking. Oh, look at this. Holy cow. Look at that. Punk. Tell him what he's won. There you Holy go. Holy cow. While we're here and we're talking with somebody who is coming to Youngstown, we do oh, have oh, an right. event in Youngstown. Two wow. events, technically. One is a VIP mm -hmm. and the other is a meetup in a live show. Love to see anybody and everybody who wants to come. There are links in the description Whatever platform you're on, there are links in the description. And it's going to be a great time. Saturday is a VIP event. That is where Mark and I are just hanging out with everybody, dare I say conspiring, mm -hmm. getting to know everybody, having a good time. That one will not be filmed, so it's private, it's VIP, it's exclusive, everything else. Then Sunday is a bigger event where we're actually having a live show. What? And that it will probably be split into two parts. One part um, being with the local politicians and what's going on with the primary coming up. They're actually having a full election in Ohio that Tuesday. Yeah, I want to get Rich so, Barris to show up. We were texting each other yesterday. Um, that'd be nice. Yeah, I've been talking to somebody but, else to see if they're going to show up. But okay. uh, but uh, we don't know for sure. But there's a, a lot of movement going on. And hopefully it'll be cool things. And then... They will probably have an intermission, and then the second show, second part will be about um, Watergate. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. So I that way you're kind of having two shows. Everybody yes, I, I know them. Watergate was in 1972. I get it, people. I don't even have to look at the comments. We're talking about 1974, 50th anniversary of Watergate, because that's when the court cases start happening in 74, uh, obviously leading up to Nixon's resignation in the summer. Uh, 74 in March, uh, 50 years prior to this event, is really where the legality of Watergate begins to cook. So we're going to look into that. There we go. All right. Um, so I want to put it out there. Anyone who has bought a ticket already, please keep your eye out it's a, for any emails from Leslie Smale. That's my wife. She's you know constantly reaching out to people to make sure that if there's a food issue or a question on dietary and different things like that. She's really been on top of and working diligently trying to help us pull this off. Now, we've got some more Super Chats here. Defuse 56. Bear pits were common outside theaters in Shakespeare's day, thus the origin of the term underdog. Hmm. Mm, the dog that went for the bear's junk. Yeah, okay, actually, the bear, the bear dog fights were bigger in the 1840s. And I think it's, from what I read, is because they uh, trouble getting bears down from upstate New York all the time. Uh, but, okay, they also had an obscure one called Dog versus Raccoon that nobody remembers that one. Raccoon fights with dogs was a big one. Uh, and then 100 rats, like I said, was the, was the record for the Fox Terrier. Prize fights were 50 cents admission. Just so you know the importance of these things. Prize fights to get in was 50 cents. To get into a dog fight or a cock fight was $2. To get into a dog versus rat fight was $4.50. And dog versus five rats, which was the mother of all entertainment, was $5. That was an insane amount of money back then. That, to you now. Even now you're you're, you're freaking out. Sure. Yeah, well, yeah, because the whole thing I find offensive. <laughs> but, yeah. No, but I'm saying they made a fortune. I mean, this guy uh, uh, at his at his rat pit, uh, was a multimillionaire. Yeah, I guess so. Jesus. Yeah, Kit, uh, uh, Kit Burns. Uh, UW, UW Thai IGH, AUS, Mary Bancroft. Question. Um, Are yes, we covering? I, I, I had sex with her. I did. And so oh, okay. did JFK. It makes two of us. Okay. So are we covering her? I doubt it. All right. Carl Burkhalter. By the 1870 census, there were no more blacks in New York City. Dozens died in the riot. Uh, that's not true because the freed blacks 
had come to New York City before the Civil War, and more of them came after the Civil War. All right. Um, Excitius. There's, there's to... only eight. I think there was only eight blacks uh, who were lynched in that entire riot. I mean, they burned the orphanage to the ground, uh, but there's there's very few estimates of more than a dozen uh, blacks being killed in those riots. I used to think the same thing. And I, every time I look at it, I see less and less blacks being lynched. Well, there weren't that many blacks in the area in comparison to other. It wasn't exactly the South. No, I know. Uh, I know. But there were quite a number because the, the, the freed blacks had been living there uh, for a long period of time. Like I said, New York had done away with slavery in 1827. So... <laughs> All right. Exciting. Yes. I just wanted to let you know that I found $10 on the sidewalk today, but I'm keeping it. Wait a minute. What are you trying to pull, Exciting? That's our money. Come on. <laughs> we get demonetized for your crimes. No kidding. Uh, Pasha, going back to watch the movie after all this background information. Priceless. Thanks again, Jeff. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, it's a big film for a lot of us history buffs. I mean, it's not JFK, but it's a, a distant second or third of those history mega movies in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And this one obviously came out in 2000, but I mean, he started it in 1970. Uh, it's still fun. And uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so well yeah. done. Yeah. All of it. So, um, Michael, great show, guys. Thanks for the voodoo. You do so well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And Keith Gordak with $20. Nice work, men. Thank you. NG or NJ Kathy, New Jersey Kathy. I'm New Jersey. With the super sticker. Thank you very yeah. much. And then Sean Brim coming in hot. Wow. $49.99. Must have touched some kind of, uh, what do I think about method actors? Well, I, I, I mean, there's a guy from England who was uh, uh, John Gilgood, uh, who said famously of Dustin Hoffman during Marathon uh, uh, Man. Uh, no, that was uh, Lawrence Olivier, I think. Oh, Lawrence Olivier said, why doesn't he just act? Yes. I kind of lean that way. I mean, Daniel Day Lewis. If I want you to think of him, that's why I say he's a maniac. It, it, he took everything to such a freaking degree. I guess even for gangs in New York, he built his own house, practiced the butchery, had circus performers he went, in there. In for three months. Yes, I had yeah, a circus yeah. performer showing him to throw the knives, and I'm like, I wonder what kind of skills this guy's collected over his lifetime with all every ridiculous. Um, Oopsie deal. Daisy, Oopsie Daisy. Yeah, and what's weird though is when you see him in an interview, he is like the most soft-spoken um, cipher. So I mean, like the best actors are ciphers. I mean, you talk to Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, there's nobody home. There's yeah. nothing there. There's no there's no personality. I mean, a lot of these guys have no personality. They fill it in and they become a person. Those are the greatest actors, uh, are the ones that have no personality whatsoever. Yeah, I guess so. And um he, he apparently he would go into a, a depression afterward because he couldn't get rid of the character or or had you know had had trouble letting the character out of his mind. I'm like, yeah, I guess so, because he he himself, I guess, had nothing, and maybe being a cobbler helps him form some kind of an identity. I, I don't know. It's just weird. Oh, oh, just saw that we addressed that question. Okay. No, I, I know, I know, but it's fifty Thank dollars, you. and I wanted to, you know, really oh. make sure it's up there. No, Folks, I thought you put it back up. Okay. I did because I want to make sure it was definitely. I didn't short shrift it. Um, Stephen McMahon, uh, you guys have one of the best shows on the net. Give all kinds of good info. Thank you. Well, I mean, these are America's stories. I mean, we're doing this for a reason, uh, politically and also socially. It's not just uh, for fun. Oh, yeah, great history lesson. Yeah. Um, thank you, Nana Three. And um, she's a Nana of three grandchildren, for Christ's sakes. That's right. And Rustus Android. I hate Leo DiCaprio, so I never watched Gangs in New York. And I'm going to have to. Thanks for that. I've never been a fan of the guy, him? but he did a good hate, job. How do you, hate, you hate him? I mean, it's a little much. I mean, it, it's not their cup of tea. I mean, okay. You know, like well, it, it's the only reason he's there is because of the nonstop from Goodfellas to Casino of Robert De Niro telling Scorsese he's got to watch this kid from uh, Eating Gilbert Grape and this boy's life, which De, De Niro was in uh, right. with them. And he, Titanic. Didn't, he didn't exist. Well, that's years later, but I mean. The Titanic He's, already happened because Scorsese said, well, I like the bankability of the Titanic. No, no, no. <laughs> but he, he was telling him this when he was in Eating Gilbert Grape. Mm. He was telling Scorsese about 
DiCaprio when he was in Eating uh, and This Boy's Life, his first two films. Okay. And he kept hearing it. And he said that uh, De Niro never offered any recommendations of anybody in his entire life to him. And he really? just kept talking to me about this kid from Eating Gilbert Grape, which I highly recommend people check out. That's amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keith Cook. Leo rubs my rhubarb the wrong way. Uh, well, check out The Wolf of Wall Street. See how bad a film that is. He's all right in that. I mean, that's, that's fun. Um, Karen Young, thank you from Southern Vermont. Always Southern Vermont? Is that near Ludlow? I don't know, but she we came won, in hot we... too. $50 there. Thank that's you. That's Ludlow Very. territory. I've been, I've been to Southern Vermont. I haven't been, but... Um... <laughs> okay, Russus Android's taking it back. Okay, hate maybe much. Thank Boy's you. life was great though. Thank you. Of course it was. Of course it was. Of course. That was a little much. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Uh, Scorsese was saying he was trying to get De Niro involved with the project and De Niro didn't want any part of Gangs in New York. That I don't that, know. That he is I helping mean, him. He was helping him with it, you know, like coming up with different things, but he apparently just didn't want to be any part. Well, he's replaced by DiCaprio eventually as a as an actor in the Scorsese world. He's hmm. almost handing off his successor to him, and De Niro, and and Scorsese is not hearing it, uh, but he keeps telling him indirectly that this is my successor, hmm. which is what he became. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. I never really, never really thought of that. But that wraps this up. A um, lot of things coming up on Freeform Friday, I believe, because uh, everything's psycho in this world. I just want to give you the names of the top Democratic uh, politicians in New York at the time. You ready? Slippery Johnny Leapsager, Cross-Eyed Murphy, Big Feet Louis Gordon, Stitch McCarthy, and Silver Dollar Smith. Those are the politicians, <laughs> not the gang members. Okay, so who are the Republicans? Before we get I, to I, that, I don't know. I, I very rarely hear about them because it's such a democratically controlled city right. that you don't hear about them, I, to be honest with you. All right. Well, let's follow Oswald. We're going to head over to locals for an after party. And we'll see you there. Mm -hmm. 